All right, everybody, uh, welcome to Maine Audubon's Climate Spotlight. Uh, this is the fourth in the Climate Spotlight series where we feature some of Maine's most innovative thinkers, businesses, and conservationists, and where we aim to help Maine people understand how climate change is impacting Maine. Um, like I said, if you'd like to watch uh, the past presentations or register for upcoming presentations, uh, which includes one we just announced for early October with representatives from the Maine Climate Council. Um, go to, let me make sure my chat here, that's the website right there in the chat. You can see what we've done so far. Uh, today, our presentation is called Maine Forests as Cl Natural Climate Solutions. And we are honored to be joined by two towering redwoods in the field of forestry conservation and science in Maine. Uh, Dr. Adam Dagno and Dr. Sally Stockwell. Uh, Dr. Dagno is an assistant professor of forest conservation and recreation policy in the School of Forestry Resources at the University of Maine. He received his PhD in environmental and natural resource economics from Ohio State University and has lived and worked in Ohio, Oregon, Washington, DC, uh, India, uh, India, I'm sorry, and New Zealand uh, before returning back to Maine in 2016. Dr. Stockwell is Maine Audubon's Director of Conservation, where she oversees all of our conservation initiatives, uh, including Stream Spark, uh, Forestry for Maine Birds, Brook Trout Survey, and many others. Um, Sally holds a PhD in Wildlife Ecology and a Master's in Wildlife Management from the University of Maine, and serves on numerous boards and committees. Perhaps most relevant uh, to this presentation is that she sits on the Science and Technical Subcommittee for the Maine Climate Council. So before we begin, uh, I have a few housekeeping items uh, and I'll paste some additional links in the chat. So uh, keep an eye out there. Um, first, uh, part of the reason we are hosting these presentations is to raise awareness of the work that of the Maine Climate Council, which is deliberating now on a new climate action plan set for release in December, which will guide Maine to meet our climate goals. Uh, we here at the end of August are nearing the deadline for public comments uh, for this plan. Uh, and the best way to submit those comments now is through some surveys um, that are on the Climate Council website. So I'm posting that link in the chat. Please, if you have not taken these surveys, please click on that link and do so. It's, it takes a little bit of time, but this is really important input for the Climate Council um, here before they sort of close the door and start deliberating. Um, Secondly, a bit of Maine Audubon housekeeping. Uh, you know, the, we are in the middle of our native plant sale. And the best thing you can do for native pollinators and birds is to plant native plants. And so here's a link to our native plant sale going on right now uh, at our Gilson Farm uh, headquarters in Falmouth. Um, everything from blueberries to asters to black cherries that support wildlife in your backyard uh, grown there at Audubon and, and for sale to you. Okay, a uh, couple pieces of the technical uh, nature right now. Uh, we're gonna start with Dr. Dagno uh, and then Sally, and we're gonna hope to wrap everything up by about 11.45 for questions. Um, if you have questions at any time, we're gonna save them all until the end, um, but please type them. If you look down at the bottom of your screen, there's a little thing that says Q&A with two speech bubbles. Type them in there, um, that uh, uh, brings them to us and we can sort through them to answer them at the end of the uh, presentation. If you have other comments or things, put them in the chat on the right side where all the other links have been. And if you wanna say hello and tell us where you're coming from, uh, that would be great. Um, of course, this is a Zoom webinar, so everyone is uh, on mute and your videos are off. Um, so that's just a, a little safety thing. So without further ado, let's get started. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Dag now. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Nick. And hello, everybody out there. Let's see if we can get this thing going. Second to share my screen, get that right. Share. All right, can I get a thumbs up from somebody that they can actually uh, see what's hopefully uh, a presentation? All right, perfect. All right, and here we go. So, um, what I'm going to talk about today is basically. Um, sort of focus on natural climate solutions, particularly for Maine's managed forests. Um, 
And this is built off of a project that colleagues and I are doing at the University of Maine. We've just finished up an interim report that I'll give you a link to at the end of the presentation. But the motivation here is really, again, driven by sort of um, Maine's Climate Council and sort of this push to be uh, carbon for the state to be uh, net zero or carbon neutral by 2045 uh, and, and sort of meet these um, uh, climate commitments of reducing fossil fuel emissions or essentially uh, gross greenhouse gas emissions by uh, 80% uh, by 2050. And the idea we had behind this is, well, how much can Maine's forests actually contribute to uh, achieving some of these goals? So what exactly are uh, natural climate solutions? Um, they're essentially uh, any action, um, figure that because we're talking about that today, let's start with the definition. And so essentially they're defined as any action that conserves, restores, or improves the use of management of forests, wetlands, grasslands, and agricultural lands, while simultaneously either increasing carbon storage or avoiding greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so the idea behind this is you can do things like protect forests, or you can manage timberlands better, or you can restore forests back to um, you know, thinking about in more historic times uh, when, when, when land use was slightly different. Um, and, and this project uh, that we've done sort of looks at uh, different aspects across all three of these. Uh, so uh, recent study by uh, Joe Fergioni and others at Nature Conservancy have basically uh, estimated that uh, nature has the potential to remove about 21% of all the US uh, carbon pollution, which is the equivalent to removing emissions from all cars and trucks on the road, and then some. And, and of, that, of that study, about uh, they estimated that forest had the, uh, the greatest contribution uh, potential, uh, about 56% of the total um, uh, mitigation that could be produced on a year-on-year -year basis from all the natural climate solutions that they evaluated. Um, but the key here is that there's different starting points that, 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 that we need to be aware of. Um, agriculture, forest, and other land use, greenhouse gases, their emissions really vary depending on where and what you're measuring. So, uh, you know, you might hear a lot, uh, you know, across at the global level about issues with deforestation, um, livestock emissions, things like that. And so 24% uh, of all greenhouse gas emissions um, uh, globally are expected to come from agriculture and forestry. However, the story is somewhat different in the U.S. and dramatically different in Maine. In the U.S., uh, total greenhouse gas emissions, uh, agriculture make up about 10%. But uh, on the flip side, U.S. forests uh, and the harvested wood products they produce are growing at such a rate that the amount um, of carbon that's produced year on year from forests are, uh, are larger than the amount that's being um, basically cut down or, or, or eliminated, thereby allowing forests to offset or remove 11% of those greenhouse gas emissions um, from the other sectors of the economy. In Maine, um, forests actually, particularly over the last 10 years, are growing at such a rate relative to, um, relative to being removed that they can actually offset or reduce uh, Maine's uh, gross greenhouse gas emissions by about 70%. So that means um, in context, uh, if you look here, the uh, green line is the gross greenhouse gas emissions that are emitted in Maine. They peaked sort of in the mid 2000s. Uh, and are now down to somewhere along the lines of 17 and a half million uh, metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. Um, the red line is the amount of additional sequestration that's coming from forests year on year uh, as a result of forest growing. All right, and so as that red line goes farther and farther below the x-axis, that means that uh, forests are sequestering more and more carbon year after year. All right, and so if you take the green line and subtract the red line, then you get the blue line, which is essentially the net carbon emissions um, in the U.S. Um, year on year. And so we're right now, we're right around the, um, about 5 million metric tons per year, um, which suggests that essentially looking at this dotted black line, forests are currently uh, removing about 70% of the gross greenhouse gas emissions in the state. All right, this is of interest because if you go to um, essentially looking at what some of the goals are uh, for the state of Maine, they're looking to reduce gross greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 45% uh, uh, below 1990 by 2030, and then 80% below 1990 by 2050, all right? This darker green line is basically the emissions trajectory that was shown in the previous slide. The other key thing to note, though, is that by 2045, there's also, through the executive order issued by um, Governor Mills last year, there's a goal to be have net emissions um, by 2045. 
So right now for context, uh, roughly our net emissions are somewhere along the lines of um, 5 million metric tons. So there's still a ways to go both on the net side and definitely on the gross side. All right, so the question then is, what exactly um, can Maine do to sort of help achieve those goals? And how can we estimate what the mitigation potential could come from uh, through these natural climate solutions? And today we're focusing primarily uh, on the forestry side of things. So the first thing what you really need to do is you need to define a base to estimate this. You need to know a baseline or business as usual pathway. So what are Maine's forests expected to do absent of any additional policy or incentives to uh, change landowner uh, behavior to maybe change the management of their forests? The second is to establish a list of acceptable mitigation practices. So what can we maybe uh, model, monitor, and verify that would be allow us to get credit um, towards reducing those uh, emissions and enhancing sequestration? And the third then is that what you need to do is look at the cost and effectiveness of implementing those practices uh, established in number two relative to number one. So we always wanna look at the change um, in trajectory of emissions relative to the cost of doing so uh, compared to a baseline or business as usual where there's no um, essentially uh, you know, no, no sort of policy in place and you wanna measure the impact uh, across those two trajectories. Okay, to do this, we have a number of costs and benefits that we can measure. So on the cost side, there's things like if you're, if you're trying to uh, put in new, new, new programs, essentially maybe enhance rotations or plant different species that are maybe um, increasing their, their rate of growth and carbon uptake faster. Uh, there's things like opportunity costs, which could be the amount of area that you're harvesting um, and then the revenues associated with that. There could be yield reductions, uh, depending on what exactly you're trying to plant um, or, or how you're looking to manage your forest. Then there's also sort of standard financial costs like the capital and equipment may be required to do some of this, the labor and maintenance. And there could also be other environmental costs. So I'm going to talk in a little bit about sort of some of the scenarios we're looking at are the, um, the, the notion that maybe you could uh, basically change civil cultural practices that have pluses and minuses into, uh, depending on sort of habitat and other environmental uh, uh, beyond just carbon and timber. On the benefit side of things, there's aspects of obviously you're looking to enhance, enhance carbon sequestration. You also could potentially get yield improvements uh, if you plant different species that maybe are growing faster or hardier. Uh, you could have a diversified income stream because now maybe you're receiving money on your land, not just for the timber that you produce, uh, but also for the carbon as well. There could be cost savings associated with not having to harvest as often um, and other environmental co-benefits that Sally is gonna touch upon uh, more, more than I will in, in her presentation. So some forestry practices that we've considered in our study are, are things like avoided deforestation or conversion to other land types, uh, afforestation or reforestation of uh, land that was previously maybe in forest, uh, doing uh, extended rotation, so basically enhancing the, the amount of stock on the, um, on, on the stand as a result of not cutting as frequently, uh, improved plantation, so this is the idea of uh, converting some land to plantation-based forestry. Uh, and then doing conservation or permanent set-asides that are essentially removing all harvests um, from a particular parcel uh, of land. So to do all this, our primary method is to use a forest landscape model called Landis. And um, when we started this project, we already had it parameterized for the um, study area of approximately 9.1 million acres in the northern half of Maine. This is the land that's uh, been primarily managed um, for by timber companies for um, sort of production of timber. And so the idea was to sort of start with that because that, that's sort of the more managed side of, of Maine's forest because we're really in, in, interested in this aspect and looking at the management side and how that can influence carbon stock. Uh, the time span we're looking to measure this over is starting in 2020 and measuring all the way out to 2100. Um, although I won't talk about it too much today, we've also looked at sort of different climate trajectories. So the idea of low and high climate change might how that might affect um, both species growth, but also species uh, uh, basically uh, species spread over, over the area, right? Because as climate expect, uh, is expected to change, that could, could uh, affect sort of the, the sort of um, zones or ranges of, of where different species could, could grow. And we're looking at a number of mitigation practices uh, of which I essentially discussed uh, above and we'll touch upon uh, shortly. As I said, the first thing what we want to do is define a baseline or business as usual scenario. So the, what we did is for basically start with the forest in 2000 um, based on a, a range of data that we had. 
and really emulated the average rate of harvesting in that area from 2000 to 2010 to calibrate what it's uh, expected to look like in the future if you sort of followed a similar trend. Our harvest practices uh, roughly uh, matched what's happening in the, in, in the landscape today, where it's 90% of the harvests are based on partial removals um, and 10% are based more on, on clear cutting. Uh, for the timber removal, if we're looking at partial removal, you're really looking at removing roughly 50% of the biomass um, from a combination of either doing actual uh, harvest trails that you need to go in and get the wood, uh, as well as group select. In addition, we've uh, set a minimum mean stand age eligible for, har eligible for harvest is 50 years. So what that's doing is restricting from someone going in and cutting too many immature trees. And we really want to also have this supply target, which is to maintain 2010 harvest levels over the duration of the, of the analysis. And so the key here aspect here is trying to look at, well, what happens if you're kind of sort of cutting similar amounts year on year? What is the forest going to look like sort of if you just follow that in perpetuity? So to get an idea of sort of how, what the model looks like, uh, we measure everything at 30 meter pixels. And, and as a result, um, on the left-hand side, is looking at sort of the density of carbon. Um, and sort of as the bluer it gets, shows sort of the more dense the, the area is. You can um, sort of see the areas of like Baxter here, right? So um, areas that are, tend to be more protected, have more older growth, late successional forests are going to have uh, the darker areas. On the right-hand side, it's just showing the sort of distribution of some of the key species that we're tracking in the model. Uh, we actually track 13 different species um, and have that uh, information available at, 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 at uh, very, very uh, high resolution. So the practices that we're modeling, uh, first thing is an extended rotation. So here you increase the minimum stand age eligible for harvest from 50 years to either 70, 85, or 100 years. The second one is to change the clear cut and partial harvest distribution. So if you recall on the baseline, this was a 10-90 a, a split uh, with the majority being a partial harvest. Um, in this case, uh, we're extending it from uh, either 30% or 40 to 50% um, of, of the amount of a total area being harvested going into clear cut. So that's similar to what was done sort of um, uh, uh, traditionally uh, back in the 1980s. Um, what we did here uh, also is we attempted to hold wood supply constant uh, as much as we could to 2010 levels, uh, which so what that did is reduce the overall harvest footprint required to get that. Um, third case is doing planting. So after you do a clear cut, you actually plant or artificially regenerate um, the stands with a mix of red and white spruce. The fourth case is the focus more on forest conservation and you reserve 10 to 20% of the land in our area, um, which is essentially permanently removed from harvest. Uh, and the last case is a triad, which is doing a mix essentially of numbers, uh, basically two, three, and four to some degree. So you're doing some clear cutting and planting, uh, uh, set asides or conservation area that's not harvested, and then the, having the rest be a business as usual harvest type rotation uh, that we had in the baseline. Two other cases that I'm not gonna to talk about too much here today, but we have in our full report is also looking at avoided forest conversion. So looking at holding 2010 forest area constant, um, but looking at projections of area that could be lost and converted to um, a little bit to agriculture, but primarily to development, um, as well as looking at areas that could be eligible for uh, afforestation, primarily sort of grasslands, hay fields, non, non um, sort of primary cropland, uh, that, that could have trees grown on them. So how do we estimate this? Uh, essentially, we first wanna look at the forest carbon sequestration components, and that's a combination of the annual change in the above ground growing stock, so that's the forest carbon, as well as the harvest carbon, which is the removed timber that's stored sort of permanently or uh, 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 in harvested wood products or landfills. And this is roughly about 20% of the carbon that actually comes, uh, uh, that, is, that is actually harvested. So if you look at sort of the decay and proliferation of um, and distribution of, of, of wood to final products, roughly 20% uh, can still be found sort of uh, in wood products or landfills after sort of 80 to 100 year time frame. And to get total carbon, we just add them together. The second case is looking at actually estimating the economic costs and benefit components. So this is a sort of um, where our study sort of goes above and beyond what a lot of other studies do that are more focused just on the ecological physiological aspects because we wanna look at sort of what's the trade-off of enhancing carbon if you have to uh, either uh, put more money into planting and maintenance, um, or you're gonna to have to reduce uh, the amount of timber that you're harvesting, right? So here we have the harvest value is basically the harvest times the state mean stumpage prices. 
uh, by different products uh, that, that, you know, in, in, in log grades. The second is look at the opportunity cost, which is essentially this trade and harvest revenue uh, relative to the business as usual. And this can be both positive and negative. It all depends on how much you're harvesting from your stand relative to that business as usual case. Um, the third aspect is planning costs. So I suggest, uh, I, I said that in some of the scenarios we're looking at um, doing aspects where after you clear cut, you actually plant as opposed to let it sort of naturally regenerate. And the last aspect is looking at land cost or rental cost. Particularly this comes into the place if you're looking to either um, minimize uh, conversion to other land uses, right? You're gonna need to uh, come up with ways to um, essentially increase the value of the land so it's not converted. Um, and or if you're looking to a forest land, you have to account for the land cost that if it's coming out of particularly um, uh, agricultural land. And the total cost is basically the opportunity plus planting plus land cost. All right, so now I'm gonna touch upon some of the, some of the results. Um, as you can see on the bottom, so what we're doing here is we're looking at the total increase year on year in mean carbon sequestration for 20 years, which is in the blue and Pardon, and 50 years, which is in the red. So the larger the bar, it means the more average sequestration you're gonna get year on year. The interesting thing here is that for extended rotations, you get a lot of carbon sort of in the first 20 years, but then as those stands mature, they become eligible to harvest and the amount of carbon that you get uh, once those stands mature kind of goes down because um, harvest supplies are sort of, um, sort of come back to, to normal level. Increasing clear cut but not planting doesn't have a large effect on, on overall carbon, both in the cases less than a million uh, and, and often sort of even less than 500,000 tons. Um, so, and for context, current forests sequester about 12 million metric tons per year of carbon dioxide. Um, so we're looking at even in the highest cases where you do increase clear cutting and plant in this sort of northern forest, um, you're going to get upwards of two and a half to three and a half million. That's still sort of less than what the business as usual case. So you could add that up on top of that 12 million. Um, just establishing set asides, again, doesn't do a lot in, um, uh, relative to the uh, clear cutting and planting, but it still can get you upwards of a million plus per year. All right, particularly when you go to the 20%, because that, what that's doing is permanently extending rotations of a certain amount of forests. And finally, the triad approach is where you're doing a mix of clear cutting and planting, set asides and business as usual. We're expecting by kind of doing that sort of mixed forestry approach, you're gonna get um, two plus million uh, tons per year. All right, so it sort of looks like it, the happy medium seems to be a way that you can, at least from a carbon perspective, um, definitely enhance your, your sequestration. But some of these come uh, at a cost in terms of reduced harvest. So on the left-hand side is the baseline. As you go left to right, we're again looking at changes in harvest. Um, in a lot of the cases, except for extended rotations and maybe the 20% triad approach, you can, you're sort of within 10% of average um, harvest rates under the business as usual case. And so this is important because opportunity costs are low, but it's also saying that you're trying to do something to maintain the sort of current forest products industry, as well as another issue that uh, aligns with, um, with sort of doing this forest carbon approach is that if you reduce harvest in the state of Maine, there could be this aspect of leakage, which says that what's what's not, um, you know, what's to prevent, you know, the market for going and buying logs from another part of the U.S. or Brazil or Malaysia or something like that. And so what that essentially is is that, um, you know, you almost want to need to do what you can to maintain harvest levels because if the market still demands wood, then they're going to grab it from somewhere else, and then the amount of carbon that you, additional carbon that you're getting here could be leaked out to another area where that, that where their carbon stocks are. Uh, the third case then is to look at the relative change to the baseline. This is a combination, like I said, of um, primarily of opportunity costs or lost revenues plus the planting costs. All right. And so we can see here the costs are quite high in the first few years of extended rotations because you're not harvesting nearly as much as, as you were before. All right. That gets diminished over time as those stands mature and become eligible for harvest. All right. Increase in clear cutting and planting costs are high there. Uh, basically because you're having to, to, to plant and, 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 and manage all those seedlings. All right, so collectively we can take these three graphs and basically use that to estimate sort of what is the average dollar per ton break even price that a landowner might need to receive, all right, to offset essential the increase in costs um, relative to also increasing the carbon stocks on their stand. All right, and so in, uh, on almost every case you're getting roughly that it's somewhere along the line of 10 to $20 per ton carbon dioxide equivalent, which is in sort of the grand scheme of things is, is very, very cheap compared to a lot of other particularly non-natural climate solutions uh, type of response. Um, these, these answers basically suggest that, that um, 
doing things like establishing set asides and maybe doing more planting uh, and more intensive managed uh, stands uh, within the state of Maine. Um, and even kind of doing that in combined form could be a very uh, cheap source of, uh, of mitigation um, for, for the state. And these, these numbers are, are you know, uh, relatively low, but in line with a lot of other studies who have looked at sort of natural climate solutions relative to non-natural climate. Um, but with all that, you're probably thinking I'm saying the word clear cut a lot, right? And with that, we do have to acknowledge that there's biodiversity and trade-offs, and Sally's gonna touch upon this a little bit more uh, coming up next. But the idea is that you sort of have to weigh these sort of um, timber benefits um, along with habitat benefits. And so we do note that basically in many of the cases, total harvest is going down a little bit. Um, but particularly when you're doing uh, the types of planting and maybe potentially some set aside, you're actually getting more spruce fir, all right? Um, which, which, which could get more carbon. But if you look at sort of um, late successional forest, all right, in a lot of cases that spruce fir might go down, except for if you're doing maybe some cases where you're primarily doing planting, um, which is allowing some of those forests not to be cut because again, you're not having to harvest as much area um, while some of those other forests mature. Um, and with that, that can sort of change the species distribution. But the key case, um, interesting enough, is that uh, lynx habitat do like those sort of wide open spaces. And so as a result, you could see this case that with more clear cuts, you're gonna get a lot more lynx habitat. But Sally will talk about more that it's not necessarily win-win for every, every sort of iconic species that you think about within the city. Um, this is just to summarize, take those same sort of um, figures that I showed before and what you wanna read here is basically as the line goes farther left to right, those are the scenarios that produce the most carbon per year. Um, and it's so these mix of these triad cases where you're doing plant and set asides, plus just high clear cutting and plant is gonna get you the most carbon, all right? Acknowledging that there are some trade-offs, um, but sort of timber harvest not being necessarily one of them. And just to summarize, um, Basically, the sort of top options by mitigation total are, are getting you between two and three and a half million uh, metric tons per year. And this is either taking the triad approach, uh, which is number two or three, or uh, the sort of clear cut and planting approach, which are getting you one and four. So all those are gonna get you noticeable change in terms of amount of carbon over the sort of medium to long run. Um, but you potentially could also just focusing on getting more set aside uh, area that's, that's permanently conserved, getting that up from, uh, sort of right now in that area, it's around six to 7% up to 20% could also get you more than a million tons a year. Uh, noting that most practices still allow harvest to continue and follow business as usual. So um, this is a, a big deal because one, it's sort of you can maintain forest products industry um, as well as minimize this risk of leakage that I talked about. But as I noted, there could be potential habitat trade-offs with clear cutting and planting versus natural regeneration and sort of the distribution of the forest types in that late successional forest. And finally, costs are relatively cheap compared to typical carbon prices um, uh, uh, in sort of other studies and other aspects of, of other sectors of the economy, which are often estimated to be $40 uh, per ton or more. In this case, we found it to be between $2 and $3. I just want to thank all my collaborators and funders on the forestry side, three other great collaborators at the University of Maine, Dr. Aaron, Aaron Simons-Ligard, Ivan Fernandez, and Aaron Weiskettle, as well as a number of, of funders and partners. Um, and um, sort of just more, if you want to find more, there's uh, the link uh, to, the, to the full report about Maine's natural climate solutions that's on our Center for um, uh, Research on Sustainable Forest website. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Happy to take more questions uh, at the end, but uh, pass it over to you, Sally. Thank you so much, Dr. Dagno. That was fantastic. It's, it's great to see some real science at work here as we try to uh, meet the challenges of climate change coming up. Thank you so much. And without further ado, well, I should say two things. I see some two great questions uh, down in the Q&A box. If you have additional questions uh, for Dr. Dagnow, uh, please put them there and we will get to them after Sally's presentation. Um, so Sally, take it away. Uh, you're on mute now, but you're ready to go. All right, I'm on mute now. No, I'm you're also unmuted. And yep. can you now see my screen? Not yet. No. Nope. Okay, let me um I gotta go back and share screen. There it is. 
There it is. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, um, as Adam said, I'm going to, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about some of the other benefits of um, using forests as natural climate solutions. And Adam talked a lot about carbon storage and uh, different, different harvesting practices, but I'm going to be focusing a little bit more on the biodiversity benefits, soil health, water quality, and flooding issues, and so that's some of those co-benefits. So first of all, I just want to set the stage for folks who may not be familiar with um, where things stand in terms of biodiversity here in Maine. So we have uh, this really incredible situation where from the coast to the mountains, from southern Maine to northern Maine, we have the equivalent ecological gradient of all of Europe in a very condensed setting. And so as a result of that, we have many different fish and wildlife species that live here. We have a um, um, wide variety of species that take advantage of all these different biogeographical settings. And uh, according to scientists from around the world, we are in a situation where climate change impacts from climate change are already affecting our biodiversity at all levels. And some folks estimate that we might be seeing as many as 34 to 58 percent of all species becoming extinct if we don't do something to address this soon. If we are able to um, particularly if species are unable to disperse, which is the case in many parts of the world now, but in Maine we still have an opportunity for animals and plants to move across the landscape if we do certain things to help that along. So you may have heard last year there was a lot of publication, a lot of press around the studies that had looked at data from the breeding bird surveys that the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has organized over the last 50 years. And uh, we now know that based on data from the 1970s to 2017, <clears throat> we have uh, lost nearly a quarter of all of our bird populations. So numbers are really declining dramatically. At the same time, we're seeing certain species shift their ranges from the southern part of the state to the northern part of the state or southern part of New England into northern New England. Um, but we, we need to do something to address these declines. Similarly, there have been very dramatic insect declines that have been discovered in other parts of the world. The, the, the interesting study that I really take, took note of was one over in Germany that looked at the decline of insects in protected areas. So in protected areas, they still lost 75% of all insects. And of course, insects provide the foundation for many food web, the food webs for many species in the, the world, including here in Maine. So this is uh, a bit alarming as well. And as an example, you know, brook trout are one of the species that lives here in Maine, that where we, really Maine is the last stronghold for this species. We have 50% of the nation's remaining wild population, over 97% of all the lake and pond populations. But all of those green areas are intact stream systems. And we have, uh, again, one of the few places left in the Eastern US where we still have good habitat. And the reason behind that is because we still have pretty good water quality and pretty good insect life. So, um, we also know, based on some predictions on the vulnerability of different habitats and species in the state, that uh, around a third of all species that were assessed during this study that was done in 2013, um, about a third of these species are likely to be highly vulnerable to changes from climate. 37% uh, highly vulnerable, 38% moderately vulnerable. And so natural climate solutions, as Adam noted, can play a really important role, not only in storing carbon, but in providing habitat and water quality, drinking water, whatever it might be, for both people and other animals throughout and plants throughout our systems. And if you look at this study from the uh, National Academy of Sciences, 
if we if we follow uh, historic emissions and continue on business as usual, then we're going to be in pretty dire straits. But if we are able to use natural climate solutions to mitigate that, we can get to the point where we are able to keep carbon emissions below a, a two degree so a, a temperature rise. And natural climate solutions can provide about 37% of that necessary storage of carbon and or carbon mitigation between now and 2030. And then on a longer time horizon, it gets a little smaller, but 20% between now and 2050. So natural climate solutions are a really important piece of the puzzle of how to address this dilemma. And this is a complicated graph, and you don't need to look at all of it, but there are there are a number of different natural pathways that were reviewed in this same article for their contribution towards meeting that decrease in, in uh, or the, the, in meeting our goals of keeping below that two degree climate temperature increase. And as you can see at the top under forests, which is our emphasis here today, reforestation is, uh, really beneficial, but that's not something that we tend to do or have done a lot in Maine in the past. It's something, as Adam noted, that we could do a little bit more of going forward. But if you look at avoiding conversion of forest to non-forest, the second one, and using natural forest management to both of those can enhance our carbon storage and other benefits as well. So they increase air quality, biodiversity, water quality, and soil health. And then if you look down at wetlands, agricultural and grasslands are, are not as uh, great options, but if you look down at wetlands, you also see that they can contribute towards this natural climate solution as well. And that's important for Maine because in Maine, about 25% of our landscape is dominated by wetlands of some sort. So in our forests, where is the carbon currently being stored? We tend to think of it as being in the tree that we see above ground, but in fact, the live tree above ground storage is only about 35% of current storage in our forests across the state. Over 50% of it is in the soil. And then there's also carbon stored in the standing dead wood, the understory, the down deadwood and in the forest floor. So all of those parts of the forest are important to what's happening with carbon in our systems. And there was a recent study done by uh, Maren Granston at the University of Maine looking at 60 years of data from the Penobscot Experimental Forest, which is outside of <clears throat> the Bangor area. And they were able to calculate based on um, the regular surveys that were done in different, there were a bunch of different forest stands that were plots that were harvested over these 60 years and, and they were able to see at a 125 year rotation time period, you're able to significantly grow the amount of carbon that is stored in the live, the live uh, overstory and in the live understory. So older trees definitely are storing more carbon over time. And one of the things that we've been seeing happening in some parts of Maine over the, the recent decades is that that time horizon has shortened for our harvesting. And there are very few trees that are allowed to grow to that 125 year age anymore. If you look at this again from a little bit different perspective, looking at the uh, on the left side, a reference plot or a control plot that where there's no harvesting compared to three different styles of harvesting, selection harvesting, shelterwood harvesting, clear-cut harvesting, you'll see again that, oops, um, all that under the uncut control species, I mean option, actually ends up storing more carbon over time than either any of the managed forest systems. And this includes harvested wood that is in long-term products that were stored, carbon is stored in furniture or buildings or whatever it might be. Um, <clears throat> so 
one of the things that we need to look at in as Adam has talked about is what what type of forest management is going to both increase carbon storage but also provide other kinds of benefits and in this case what we're seeing is that forests with more uh, structural diversity and lengthened harvesting rotations are storing the greatest amount of carbon. So, and, and this is really important for um, biodiversity issues. If we look at the two photos on the right, one northern hardwood forest and a northern softwood forest, you'll see that there's a lot of structural diversity in those forests. These are older forests where you have a pretty good understory, pretty good midstory, pretty good overstory. There are dead trees on the ground, dead standing trees, big trees, smaller trees, diversity of species. And that structural diversity over time, if allowed to develop over time, provides not only great habitat for different species, but also stores more carbon over time. So what are some things that we can do to combine what Adam's talking about with these biological interests? And the Nature Conservancy some years ago looked at, has, has done quite a bit of work looking at where are the climate strongholds, where are the climate resilient landscapes, and all you need to pay attention to in this graphic is where the dark green areas. And you'll see that Maine pops out as a dark green area that has the potential to be very uh, a great climate stronghold, meaning that we can, over time, keep the diversity of, of habitats and systems in place to support wildlife and plant and animal habitat going forward, in addition to providing other benefits. Why is that? Well, because we have the opportunity to, first of all, protect diverse landscapes. That's one of the best ways we can provide for movement of plants and animals over time. As long as we have mountains, river valleys, low-lying wetlands, and any combination of this, then we know that as plants and animals are moving across the landscape, they will be able to find the conditions that they need to survive and thrive over time. They may be different than what we have here today, but they will be able to find the conditions they need. On top of that, um, wetlands are a really key piece of the landscape that we need to be thinking about. If we can protect and connect these wetland habitats, a lot of species that use wetlands move from one wetland to into the forest or from one wetland to another wetland over the course of their year and so it's really important not only to protect the wetland itself but connected areas between wetlands. And if we can protect these forests as carbon storage areas and other benefits, one of the things that we know that it, it provides really great water quality and drinking water. For example, in the Sebago Lake watershed, the Portland Water District provides water supply for over 200,000 people in Maine, almost a quarter or a fifth of the people in Maine. This is one of only 50 public water supplies in the US that doesn't have to filter the water <clears throat> before providing it to the public. They treat it with chlorine, but they don't have to filter it. And why is that? Because the watershed that provides the water into Sebago Lake, where they draw the water from, is pretty intact forest habitat. So there's a big push right now to protect forests and riparian areas within that watershed so that they don't have to move to a filter system, which is extraordinarily expensive. And so the Portland Water District is actively working with landowners and others to, in the region to protect those forests. We can practice exemplary forestry. So one of the options is, of course, to protect land, but another, as Adam said, is to improve forest management. New England Forestry Foundation has come up with a series of recommendations for what does exemplary forestry management look like? And it combines both uh, climate adaptation and resilience with these other best practices that can improve forest products, but also improve habitat for plants and animals. And some of those are providing a balance of young and old forests. So as Adam mentioned, the, uh, if we increase our 
acreage of clear cuts, then over time, those will develop into great habitat for lynx. Canada lynx are <clears throat> one of what we might call an umbrella species that represents those species that benefit from those younger forests. And up to 40% of Maine invertebrates will use that, <clears throat> excuse me, will use those younger forests. But there's really not that many species that are tied specifically to early successional habitats. And, and then by contrast, American Martin are representative of those species that need older, more structurally complex forests. And over 70% of our main vertebrates use that similar type of habitat. So there's a, a, a number of different folks, including the New England Forestry Foundation, Maine Audubon through our Forestry for Maine Birds program, and who are suggesting that long term we might want a goal of around 10 to 20 percent of the landscape in these younger forests and 40 to 50 percent of the landscape in older forests that include very large saw timber. So one of the things we've been trying to promote here at Maine Audubon through our Forestry for Maine Birds program, for example, is the importance of mature forest stands. As I've already mentioned, these stands can hold a lot of carbon, but they also are structurally diverse. They have large trees along with smaller trees coming up underneath them. They might have gap openings that are from a tenth of an acre to two acres that are um, representative of natural disturbance regimes from long ago. They include large dead standing trees and down trees that are used by things like pileated woodpeckers and other animals that use cavities and then things like marten and fisher that need those down logs to actually move through the forest. If we provide more of that uh, mature forest breeding habitat, then we're also going to be doing a good job of protecting Maine's baby bird factory. So Maine is really critical to the future of many of our bird species. This is a, a graphic that shows how different species use different types of forests and also different features within the forest. And they're very sp specific about what they like. And the more structurally complex the forest is, the more species you can pack in, the more individuals of each species you can pack in. Another really important thing is to conserve our waterways and riparian habitat. There are many of our, our current commercial landowners focus on doing um, a little bit different harvesting in these riparian areas, riparian areas being those areas along streams and other waterways. Uh, they may let those trees grow a little bit older, they may not cut as heavily, but we could be doing more. These are one of the places where those mature forests could really come into play. And by doing that, you also then protect the water temperature. So we have cold water full of oxygen for things like brook trout and Atlantic salmon. And we have um, trees that are growing old enough, they can fall into the water and create the pools that are necessary to keep the, the climate refuges for when the water temperatures get really warm in the summer. So riparian habitats are really important. These are also places where a lot of animals, including things like mink, but even deer, will move along from, they will use the corridor adjacent to the stream to move from one part of the forest to another part of the forest. And then finally, we can, um, we can reconnect streams using stream smart crossing standards, which are really designed to both provide the opportunity for fish to move up and down the streams to get to these different habitats and other animals that also move up and down the streams, but also keep the land from flooding and, um, and keep our infrastructure secure so that the, the Culverts aren't washing out, bridges aren't washing out, and this is another program that Maine Audubon has been very involved with, working with lots of other partners on. So I'll leave it at that. That's a quick introduction, but if you are interested in learning more about what we're doing on this front, you, I encourage you to go to our website, and we have a section in there on climate change and renewable energy, and another section on other conservation projects we're working on. You can get in touch with either Nick or me if you have specific questions we can't answer right now. I'll turn it back over to you, Nick.
Thank you so very much, Sally. That was fantastic. And what a great transition because we do have lots of questions. Um, and so in the interest of time, uh, and we can go over a little bit if folks want to hang on, but in the interest of time, let's get to those questions now. I'm going to try to start um, with maybe some of the quicker ones. Um, for uh, Dr. Dagno, could you just uh, run through what clear cutting is and how it, what, what role it plays in carbon sequestration? Yeah, sure. So um, for the late term, clear cut is essentially, you know, taking a plot of land and removing basically, you know, high, high, high proportion of all the trees that are on there. Sometimes you might leave some residual uh, uh, trees or whatever um, to help with, with reseeding or, but generally it's, you know, take an acre and cut off almost every tree possible, right? So that's very traditionally different than at least what's happening on the landscape here in Maine, right? It's very much more what you'd see in, in the South or, or out West if you drive out and see the mountainside with, with half the trees. Um, Great. The key, the key with that is that, and this comes to a thing where I want to sort of, I saw some questions popping up about sort of, Sally put up some slides that look a little bit different than mine when we're sort of showing what carbon storage is versus carbon sequestration. So these terms can get used interchangeably, but they're quite quite different. I want to sort of point out storage is like if you go out and you just you know started measuring trees and measuring the soil, it's how much carbon is currently there right now. Sequestration is essentially the change in storage year on year. So it's if you went you know this year and measured the stand and said, well, this much is in the soil and this much is in the tree and this much is in dead debris, and then next year you went and measured the storage again. The sequestration is actually how much more increased uh, carbon increased on that stand from one year to the other. So the clear cutting aspect that we're getting at is that particularly if you plant, you're taking sort of a mature stand, right, or semi-mature um, that maybe isn't growing as fast. You're cutting it down and then you're maybe, particularly if you're putting it into a plantation style, you're, plant, you're, you're basically putting in trees that are growing faster over time. And so that rate of change in storage or sequestration might be going up relative to whatever was planted there before. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to try to combine some questions here about soil and how uh, soil works as part of the process. Um, does, uh, as Sally pointed out, a lot of the carbon is down underground. Does it, does it stay there? And, and how, does it, um, it, how does it come out or is it locked? And then um, do different forest practices, including road building or ground disturbance, uh, impact how the soil can um, uh, carbon. Yeah, so, so this is good. This is if, if my colleague Ivan Fernandez, the soil scientist guru were here, he'd, he'd, he'd take that on, but I'll do my best. So again, if you looked at Sally's um, uh, sort of storage in the PEF case, there was sort of a block that was really flat, big, but flat on the bottom. That's the soil that's in the forest. All right, and it's traditionally or generally quite flat. There can be things like harvest practices that basically uh, do affect some of the upper layers, upper horizons of the soil, but, but generally, that's why I'm focusing more on above ground. Generally, there's, you know, you'd have to have a very big disturbance to change that. Even transitioning to a different land use, most of the soil is still, is still sequestered or, or, or stored um, from that perspective. An interesting aspect, if you build roads or even convert to development, technically you can just pave over the, you know, you could put a shopping mall on top of, of a, you know, forest soil, right? And it would be stored there forever. The key is that you wouldn't be able to increase it anymore, right? Because you don't have any actual biomass roots, things like that going into the soil to enhance it uh, as well. But that's generally why it's, it's pretty flat over time and why I didn't really focus on that uh, in my study, because I'm thinking more about the rate of change in storage over time or sequestration. Gotcha. Uh, a question for Sally from Roger Zimmerman. How will a shortened warming winter season affect complex forest habitat? How will a shortened season... So as the winters get warmer, as the climate um, yep. warms, how will that affect forests? I don't really have the good, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Adam. It's, uh, you know, we're, we're, gonna, we're definitely going to be seeing some changes, but I don't know what those are going to Yeah, it's sort, of a, it's sort of an it depends, right? So you, you are going to see basically um, the general forest composition continue to shift northwards, right? So those, are on, those species of trees that are on some southern end will basically keep going into Quebec. Right, so that could affect again some composition of, of, of forest structure. Um, generally, it's more, I think, more hardwoods are going to basically continue to shift northwards, right? So, 
it's it's a sort of it depends type case, but tradition it, again it, it it comes down to which, um, and I think Sally, we did this sort of in our Maine Climate Council talk. We talked about um, the aspect of with that space change in, in species, you're gonna you, um, it's not good or bad overall per se. It's just gonna have you're gonna have different different birds and things like that coming to Maine as as a result. So it sort of depends on which what your sort of species of choice, whether you think it's going to be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, the issue with that, on top of that, is there will be probably more, you know, trees are more prone to uh, pest and disease and things like that, which which could increase the sort of the, the vulnerability of, of our forest. Yeah, and I, maybe I didn't, wasn't thinking right about the question, but certainly um, the species composition will change. The interesting thing is we don't necessarily know whether the same species that are typically seen together now will be seen together in the future or whether we'll have entirely new mixes of species. And so that could change, you know, the, as Adam said, the makeup of the forest and who's there. But as long as you, you allow those forests to grow over time, they will still be structurally complex. Provide Great. lots of different features for different species. Uh, question from Ernie Johnson about forest fires. Uh, to what extent do forest fires currently present a threat to unmanaged versus managed forests in Maine, and how will anticipated climate scenarios change this? Yeah, so you know, we 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 do have a number of active forest fires in Maine, but they tend to be quite small. Um, the sort of the projections that we've done don't indicate that that risk is going to get dramatically higher. So I don't imagine that we're going to see anything like you see on TV out west or anything, even under more extreme climate conditions um, just because of the rate of precipitation and, and things like that, that that happened in Maine. So even regardless of sort of the management approach, I, I wouldn't expect fires to be the primary threat. I think the pest and disease aspect um, that could be driven uh, or exacerbated by climate is going to have a greater impact on, on, on Maine's forest than, than fire itself. Yes, and I would just add to that that historically fires were not a big natural disturbance in Maine forests historically and as Emma said because all predictions are we're going to have even more precipitation than we have now it may come in different ways than what we're seeing so the distribution of that precipitation may be uh, different as we're already seeing some of the middle of the summer is getting hotter and drier but um, there's so much moisture in our forests compared with those out west it's not that's not likely to be a huge concern. Great. Um, I do want to pause and just say that we're approaching the 12 o'clock time. So we do still have a bunch of questions. So if the panelists can hang on for a few minutes, um, that would be great. For folks who need to jump off, uh, thanks so much for joining us. The full presentation with anything you might miss after this uh, will be up on our website uh, as soon as I can. Um, so a question from David about uh, wood stoves. I think this is a sort of a biomass energy question. Um, better or worse than oil for kerosene fuel heating devices in the winter from a point of view of carbon release? Yep, so there's actually been a study conducted in northern New England um, by a uh, colleague John Gunn, who's down now down at University of New Hampshire, formerly at Manament. Um, a lot of people have asked this question, particularly circling around this, you know, the idea of biomass bio, and, and wood pellets and going to Europe and all that. And um, he's estimated that roughly it's about about 50% better than, than oil-based heat in terms from a carbon emissions perspective. Primarily because we have an abundant source of forests here, um, you know, cutting down some trees to, to, to service firewood could, could basically allow more space for other trees to grow. There's other aspects like that, but generally, generally in, this, in this part of the country, um, wood-based wood heating um, in wood stoves is, is better than, than using oil, which is essentially the, you know, the primary source. Great. Um, Adam, a couple of questions for you about uh, uh, when the reports might be finalized and available for folks to look at. Yep, so um, in the chat, I put the, uh, the link to the report and the fact sheets. So the sort of what we say is an interim report was published last, last week. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to continue to do sort of more layers of modeling on top of that, more where we're going to diversify our, our, what we're looking into, more intermediate treatments, maybe um, as talking about these aspects of uh, set aside and sort of primary uh, key areas to conserve more, touching exactly on what Sally talked about, probably there's a bigger push to think about um, 
uh, preserving riparian zones and things like that. So um, some of the numbers might change slightly uh, or we might have more scenarios, but what we have up on the website is, is pretty much 95% um, gonna be uh, held the same. Uh, final report is due um, in January. But what we want to do is get as much information out as possible um, while the main climate council were sort of in their consultation deliberations um, leading into, into uh, their sort of decisions uh, in December. Great. I just want to try to get to a couple more. A question from Jeff Reardon uh, for both panelists. Uh, there are multiple recommendations for, quote, no harvest buffers in riparian areas. Um, is there a strategy to increase set-asides by focusing on riparian areas where wildlife and fisheries benefits are higher? And I can put that in the chat too, if you'd like to. Yeah, no, well, I guess that's sort of what I was just saying is there has been emphasis both from, we've, we've, we're at University of Maine, we've been asked by numerous people to think about that and what are the implications of doing that from a policy perspective. So that's why I say is that definitely one of the next scenarios we're going to evaluate is what is the effect if we focus on set asides and really focus on those more sort of designated sort of high habitat uh, areas. I'll pass it on to you, Sally, to provide some more insight. Well, I think the only other thing I would add is that I believe that the Natural and, uh, and Working Lands Subcommittee of the or Working Group of the um, Maine Climate Council has put that in as one of the recommendations as well. That that should be that you know there should be more attention paid to those riparian areas. Great. I just want to do two final if, questions. If not, if, if not, then I encourage um, members of the public to emphasize the importance of that. Take those surveys. The link is in the chat. Um, two final questions. I want to make sure to get to. If, if folks have other questions that we don't get to, um, please. Uh, if folks could put their emails in the chat or other ways you, that, that uh, people could reach out to you, that would be helpful. Sally had hers a minute ago. Um, from Elizabeth Jackson, is any entity developing incentives for landowners not to harvest trees? So, well, there's, there's programs out there, you know, um, carbon sequestration programs through like the state of California and stuff that basically do provide incentives to do basically forest management above and beyond what sort of a business as usual case is. It's sort of up to the landowner to decide what that may be. So in theory, you can get uh, compensated for not cutting at all. Um, often when it comes down to bottom line, that's not basically the most efficient option to take. Um, and, and a lot of people want to manage forests, not just for carbon, but also for the sort of timber resource as well. But in theory, you, you could enroll in the, the California program and, and get paid not to, not to harvest at all. And, and I would add to that that um, the New England Forestry Foundation is working on a project in Western Maine. It's funded through the Natural Resources Conservation Service to try to get landowners to think about grow, uh, growing trees, for, growing bigger trees over a longer period of time, uh, what they might call legacy trees and trying to commit to at least a 30 to keep those trees um, growing through the biological life of those trees as opposed to the economic life of those trees. And um, Northeast Wilderness Trust is another organization that's very much involved in promoting the, the importance of protecting uh, areas that are no cut areas. So I think there is, and, and you know, Maine also has a, an ecological reserves program and those ecological reserves do not allow any harvesting. They're primarily being used as sort of research baseline places, but also as places to protect our, our current um, current natural variety of natural communities. But they could, the, that program could, could potentially be expanded to add to the, as part of that triad approach that Adam mentioned that involves at least some more uncut areas. I think there's, I think there's a real role to explore the extent to which that might be beneficial. Great. Um, I just want to end on a question about uh, Adam's work with the timber industry in Maine. Um, how closely do you work with them? And, and um, maybe if you want to say a few words about the relationship there. Yep. So, um, you know, at the University of Maine, I'm in the School for Forest Resources. So we kind of take a very broad approach to forest management. Um, you know, I know of most of the people in the industry. I, you know, my role in policy is to understand all the different angles, but um, I don't have any specific contracts or anything like that with them. Um, the, the, the key is basically to try to 
capture all sides from that perspective. Um, you know, we did float a lot of these scenarios through both industry and nonprofits, environmental NGOs to actually understand, are these reasonable and, and are these something that you would consider? And sort of on both sides of the spectrum, we got the like, this would be very useful to, to understand the sort of implications from that perspective. Um, yeah, my view that might seem, I don't want to say pro industry, but, but, but from that perspective is I'm very much sort of rural, you know, I'm an economist and I think about rural economies. And so we have to acknowledge that, that there's a number of rural economies in Maine that either have been or are still dependent on sort of natural resource and extraction to some degree. So that the best is how do we find that happy medium where we can have win-win situations across sort of the spectrum. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, so before we, the Zoom boots us off, I'm going to cut it off there. There are some still questions left to be answered. I'll make sure those get to the uh, appropriate panelists and, and you can also feel free to email folks. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining. We had a ton of people on today uh, from Maine's Climate Spotlight. I want to thank Dr. Adam Dagnow from the University of Maine and Dr. Sally Stockwell from Maine Audubon for joining us. Um, again, for those who missed it, this will be um, the link to the recording will be online uh, soon and have a great week. Thanks so much. And thanks to the panelists. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Nick. And thank everybody for joining us. Really appreciate it. Bye everyone. Have a great day.